Okay, uh, it's just a pleasure to be here. And so, uh, this is actually based on a book chapter I've written for a conference in Switzerland. And what they were looking for is to look at copyright, or actually IP and material and material goods. And so, I thought I would take a historical approach to start off from the cost of copy before I get into the discussion about how that has been changing. So, obviously, if you go back to the Statue of Anne, you can see a strong focus on copies because at that time, copy is basically referring to the manuscript. So what you do is basically you present your uh, manuscript in, uh, at the stationer's hall, and then you put your title into the register. And uh, that concept has been copied into our uh, first Copyright Act, 1790 Act. And so if you see that, uh, the emphasis of copies of such map, chart, book, or books is right there as well. Uh, and the emphasis is still with respect to the copies of uh, the different creative works. So one big question with respect to this concept of copy is actually the uh, case about a, p uh, a piano roll, Whitesmith. And so the question is whether some of these perforated rows are actually considered as copies within the meaning of the copyright statute. And that's a big question uh, before the court at that time. And they've decided that, well, those musical tones are not a copy which appeals to the eye in no sense can musical sounds which uh, reach us through the sense of hearing be said to be copies as that's generally understood. And so the court has rejected uh, this concept, but in the end, they basically incorporate this idea into the 1909 Copyright Act. So they have set up the mechanical uh, provision uh, with respect to compulsory licensing. And fast forward to the uh, current Copyright Statute, and uh, if we can look at uh, the definition in other places, Copy and copies have appeared in the Copyright Act more than 300 times. So that concept has been continued uh, in uh, the current statute and has been used in a lot of different places. And so if you look at section 106, you can see that uh, the rights include the reproduced copyrighted works in copies and also uh, with respect to 163, you got distributed copies. Uh, the interesting thing about how uh, and we uh, approach the concept of copy is that we are expanding this concept in a way that we are not just focusing on the rights in the copies, but also we are focusing on the action, right, to copy something. And so here you can actually look at the word, uh, the phrase we produce the copyrighted work in copies, or to say to copy the reproduce, uh, to copy the copyrighted works in copies, right. So you can get a sense as to both copy as a verb as well as copy as a noun, and which is actually quite important down the road in terms of what I'm going to say later on in the presentation. Um, and one big question with respect to the digital environment is about ephemeral copies. How are you going to handle all these uh, ephemeral copies or temporary copies that are created in a digital environment? And so um, uh, we have a white paper uh, at, uh, uh, summarizing the different types of laws and drawing on MAI as well as other cases they believe that uh, informal copies will be covered within the current copyright statute uh, within a reproduction right. Uh, the difficulty though is that there is major disagreement throughout the world in terms of whether the reproduction right will actually extend into the digital environment. So uh, Bruce Lehman, at that time the commissioner of the PTO, figured out a very good strategy. Just go to Geneva, <laughs> this is what we usually call policy laundering. You go to another place and talk to other countries trying to figure out how we can actually come up with a good, a good treaty or a good instrument to tackle the issue. And so the WIPO Internet Treaties, the WIPO Corporate Treaty is a very good example. Uh, and if, uh, what's interesting is that they are trying to include the draft Article 7 in the WIPO Corporate Treaty. Except that a lot of countries do not necessarily agree that the uh, reproduction right would necessarily extend into the digital environment. So eventually they will reach a compromise uh, in a agreed statement. And so now what you have is not a provision within a Bible copyright treaty, but an agreed statement. The first one talk about how the reproduction right will fully apply in the digital environment, and that's the first part. The second one is right here and talks about how uh, it's understood that the storage of a protected work in digital form in an electronic medium constitutes a reproduction within the meaning of Article 9 of the Bern Convention. Now what's interesting about this particular sentence is that the votes are right here, 41, 13, 28, 63. 63 are those people who have already left the room. And so we are, uh, uh, 48, 41 is basically the people who agreed to do it, 13 is the, those people who said no, and 28 is the abstention. And so here, uh, based on the numbers, it shows quite controversial with respect to this particular part. 
And that third sentence with respect to our agreed statement is about uploading and downloading of copyrighted works. Now, those of you who have taught international copyright law probably find that, well, there's no uh, sentence like this in that agreed statement. Uh, there are only two sentences right there. And the reason behind it is that this one has been rejected. And that's why when you look at that agreed statement, instead of having three sentences, you only get two. And the other thing that they try to do within the discussion of the wiper internet treaties is to figure out how to do making available. Would that be included within the right of distribution, or would that be included uh, within the right of communication to the public? So the Europeans prefer this approach, whereas we prefer the other approach. And so eventually they figure out to create an umbrella solution so that they can include the right of making available in both uh, uh, provision. So if you can see Article 6, you have this provision right here, and then Article 8, you also have this provision right here. So that means you can either use the right of uh, communication to a public or the right of distribution to cover the act of making available. And, um, and we incorporate uh, the uh, provisions within the WIPO treaties into our DMCA. And, um, and one thing that we also added is about a safe harbor uh, for a lot of internet service providers. And that's very similar to what we have in the uh, Information Society Directive uh, in the European Union. So what is interesting when I was working on the project is that a lot of those discussions seem to continue today in uh, the digital environment in terms of how we're going to deal with the issues with respect to uh, copying. And so the first one is uh, 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 continuing from what we have early on with respect to a reproduction right. And so there's a major case, uh, Melwater in the UK, and that has gone all the way uh, to the uh, uh, Court of Justice of the European Union. So what they do is basically they have snippets of all the news articles, and then they have the titles, they have the information, and they'll send it to you through email. So when you're clicking on the email, you will be able to access the cache copy. Uh, and the, um, a lot of those uh, rights holders, are not, especially the newspapers, are unhappy with the fact that you basically have the headlines and everything, and people are no longer going to their website to actually uh, read what they have. So they uh, decided to sue uh, the company for putting together all this uh, uh, synopsis and excerpts for them. And the claim is that, well, if you are having a cash copy, that will be covered within the corporate statute. Uh, and that case, when that case went all the way to the Court of Justice, they've decided that it's actually covered within the Article 5.1 exception. That will not be uh, included because there's temporary acts of reproduction. So that, to some extent, brings back some of the earlier discussion we have with respect to temporary copies from the White Paper, the White Book Corporate Treaty, as well as uh, down the road with respect to the Information Society Directive. The second one is with respect to distribution right. And so the case I usually use is Redigi, and I think that is a very interesting case uh, with respect to what's going on with the first sale doctrine. And so Redigi is basically allows uh, the users to uh, resell the MP3 uh, tracks or item tracks they have. So if you purchase, uh, for example, Green Spears, and you find out that, well, I move on to Lady Gaga, I want to uh, actually try to uh, dispose of the, the different uh, uh, item tracks, you can do that. The difficulty, though, is that if you try to do that in a digital environment, you have to create other copies to others. And that's why when the case went before the uh, district court, they ran into trouble with respect to a reproduction right. Because when you're transferring one copy that you previously owned to another co uh, person, you have to reproduce a copy so that they can get it. So uh, they've been found to have copyright infringement, but uh, they have the second version of the software, which is actually very interesting. What they do is that they will have the copy in cloud uh, locker in the first place. So if you're going to sell your copy, what they do is change the ID of the locker instead of making a second copy. So that, to some extent, removes the problem with respect to creating an extra copy. And I think the, uh, this uh, new platform is actually uh, somewhat challenging in terms of whether that is actually considered uh, uh, OK under current corporate law or whether that's not. And the third right I want to look at is the public performance right and in part because there are a lot of cases, not just in the US, but in other places. Aerial is a very good example. That's before the US Supreme Court. Uh, the TV catch-up case is uh, within the European Union. And then in Japan, you also have the Manaki TV case. So basically, you have a lot of cases with similar issue. But one of the big issues is that if, when they're trying to create the antenna or create other type of technological uh, tools to bring to, uh, to the internet users the TV programs, 
One question is, well, are they going to create copies within here? Or if they're going to create copies, who is going to create those copies? Is it uh, uh, controlled by the user? Is it controlled by the intermediaries? And who are going to do that? What's interesting is when you get before the Supreme Court, they've decided not to focus on the concept of copy as they have done in the cartoon networks as well as other cases. Uh, what they're focusing on is basically just whether this is an act of public performance and whether this is similar to cable TV or not. And so the court was not able to address that question. And the final right is the right of making available. And um, the example I'm going to use is uh, from Hong Kong. And so it's not just because it's my hometown, but also it's also because this is the first criminal case with respect to a bit torrent user. Uh, and so what's interesting is that in a lot of Commonwealth countries, they actually have this concept of infringing copy. In order for you to have any criminal action, you need to be able to find infringing copy. The difficulty with respect to BitTorrent is that you might not necessarily have an infringing copy. Because what you do is the seeder will set up a, a transfer protocol that will bring together piece and pieces from all the different computers and then combine the, uh, uh, the pieces into a final copy in the user's computer. So if you're looking for somebody to distribute an infringing copy, that person might not have distributed because that person might just have set up a protocol to allow the different pieces to be collected so what you'll find is that there will be an infringing copy in the user's computer, but there might not be an infringing copy that's been distributed. And so when the uh, prosecutor was trying to prosecute this case, they have to go for attempt to distribute as opposed to distribution. Because it's very hard for them to show that they, they have already, uh, they, uh, the uh, accused have uh, distributed an infringing copy. And so uh, when it gets to the, uh, before the uh, court of final appeal, those judges are not into intellectual property issues, and so uh, they were mixing up the distribution issue and making available. So what they look at is that distribution is basically uh, the necessary steps to make the item available. But this is actually closer to a right of making available. There's a major dispute within uh, the Weibo Copyright Treaty, where distribution is somewhat different. And then they go even further to say that, well, this is basically just like soft drink. When you go there and insert the coin, and then they will distribute the soft drink to you, but, then, uh, the, but at the same time, uh, the soft drink is inside the machine, and so until you insert the coin, you will not be able to get that. So that's the analogy the court has used. So what I want to end on is four concluding observations. The first one is the changing nature of the concept of copy, and so that is a payoff from uh, uh, Bill Patrick in spoke. And so what, what he says is talk about how we are actually moving to the environment where we are not focusing on copies. Right, so you have copyright laws without copies, and that to some extent also tie into other scholarship. So Aaron and Jason also talk about the post-copy uh, world in terms of how we are moving beyond that. The second observation is about different usage of copy. And so if you go to a dictionary, you can see that a copy can be used as a noun and also as a verb. And the way I look at this one is if copy is used as a noun, it's more likely to provide the constraint and the limitation. If the copy is used as a verb, it's more likely to expand. It's going to uh, give uh, the rights holders more protection. And uh, that has been picked up uh, uh, even earlier uh, by Ray Patterson, uh, who passed away, unfortunately. And uh, if you go back to the Statue of Anne, you can see that the focus is really about the copies. So when you focus on copies, then the rights are not as ex expansive as what we have today. And when you think about how the uh, the 76 Act, we have been expanded to some extent, and eventually that might even go even further. The third observation is about strategic use of copy. So you can use it both as a sword as well as, well as a shield. So with respect to a sword is that a lot of the rights holders have been using this concept to push for strong protection of copyright. And I think that to some extent led uh, Jessica Lehman as well as others to, to find it highly problematic. So she has a very interesting chapter called Copy Fetish about how people see copies everywhere, and that's the way they prove, uh, they were able to push for a more expansion of copyright. But at the same time, in cartoon networks as well as in Arial, you can see that copy has been used as a defense, and by saying that, well, we focus on whether that copy is actually covered here, whether that copy has been individually made specifically for that particular user. And so that, to some extent, is in defensive use. And the final observation I want to have um, is basically, if we have copyright without a focus on copy, is it a good thing, right? We keep on talking about copyright, and the public still relate to copyright because it's the right to copy. And when you think about it, if we are actually not focusing on copy, 
Uh, the benefit is that, well, we can actually talk about the historical origin of the right. The drawback, though, is that uh, we are creating a lot of uh, problems with respect to terminology. So Richard Stallman is one of those who have been heavily criticizing intellectual property as a term. Right? He believes that's not a good idea. And on top of that, we also have a very polarized debate with respect to uh, uh, copyright, with respect to other forms of IP. And so if we have copyright without the, uh, uh, focusing on the copy, is it a good idea to continue to use that term? Or should we actually think about whether we have access rights or something some, uh, somewhat different? So I'll stop here, and I still have six minutes. So I'll take some questions. Yes, Chuck. Um, it seems to me that the derivative works right is under theorized in the case law because courts tend to just rely on the copy, the reproduction, right? And you know they do that even though it's it's the noun copy that's used instead of the verb. That hasn't really seemed to constrain application of that, right? So would making the changes that you're urging just sort of push? a lot of problematic aspects of copyright law down the line to the derivative works, right, or the, or the distribution, right? Whereas now they're often sort of glossed over because the court can just hold it all into section. So if you ask me this question five years or ten years ago, I may say that that might be true. But I see some hope in terms of cases like uh, the RDL books case, the Harry uh, Potter lexicon, where the court is actually trying to make the distinction with respect to whether it's reproduction, whether the derivative work was being covered. And so if more courts are willing to do that, I don't see that as big a problem. But if courts are going to lump uh, all of this together, and I think it's quite problematic. And I think a lot of commentators believe that in the digital environment, derivative work right will actually be more important uh, than a lot of the things we've been talking about. And I think that will also be true uh, with respect to public performance or making a faith. Right? When you think about, for example, Apple Music, they are trying to get people away from ownership to access, right? The more we focus on access, the, the less we will talk about reproduction. Yes, all right. I just wanted to put on the table, surely, surely you're aware of it, the use of decision from the European Court of Justice, which is very interesting, right? That's the sort of the European equivalent of ReDG, more or less, and we're used to think about the European Court as very formalistic and attached to the legal technicalities and ignoring reality. It's exactly the opposite in this case, right? The re court said, look, there's a copy. That means that there's no first sale. We wash our hands. There's nothing we can do, right? The European court basically said, it doesn't make any sense. If we say that, we're going to kill the exhaustion uh, privilege or, 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 or interest or whatever. It doesn't make any sense, right? And it just go on. So it's very interesting, right? It's basically totally the opposite than what many of us are used to think about American courts and European courts. I'm glad you mentioned the use of case, and that's uh, in the uh, book chapter, but not in your presentation because of audience. Uh, so the use of case is interesting in the sense it's basically about all these licenses to use the uh, I think the Oracle system, uh, and so basically they we sell the software licenses if they uh, and to others, and so the Court of Justice is believed that well that's actually covered within the exhaustion right uh, within the software directive, and the interesting thing about that case is that. After they've decided this one, I think a year and, and, and three months later, they have the opposite case, where they actually talk about whether exhaustion would go so far with respect to information society directive. So all posters is about people taking over a po uh, poster or photo, and then they uh, transform the medium into a different piece of artwork. Right? So and it's very similar to some of the, the, uh, the, the two cases we have with respect to uh, Levy Art and Mirage Lee, uh, Lee, I think. Uh, in, in the corporate, um, uh, corporate field here. And so uh, the, I think most people would distinguish the two cases is basically uh, the opposite case is about the alteration of the medium, right? And that's why you should look at it differently. The difficulty I have with that argument is that the Court of Justice spent a lot of time talking about uh, exhaustion. And so if you are focusing on exhaustion, uh, then you have to at least deal with this particular case. And I think it's even broader than that because um, the use of case, the court focused mostly on the software directive. Whereas the opposite the case is about the information society directive. And so if we are talking about things that are actually not software, uh, and that's in the digital environment, are we going to have to seriously engage with that decision 
or are we going to just rely on use of decision? But that's a, a, actually a very good point. Other questions? Thank you very much.